The foundation for a new way of understanding the beautiful intricacy of our planet and how we can best steward its enduring stability is science. When E.O. Wilson conceived of Half Earth, he imagined that we would bring together our scholarship from many walks of life, many areas of expertise and experience, and work together within the spirit of a moonshot. He imagined that by driving significant scientific innovation, we would provide leadership regarding the most effective path forward for protection of endangered species and endangered ecosystems. In this moment, as we are increasingly coming to understand how caring for all of life must be informed by science, that research is the topic of our next session, The Science of Half Earth. I'm very pleased to introduce Walter Yetz, Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and of Forestry and the Environment at Yale University, Scientific Chair of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, and Scientific Lead of the Half Earth Project Map. Putting species on the map. Species are not just beautiful and each with a fascinating story to be told as, as we've learned from some of Ed Wilson's writing. They're also the critical elements that underpin nature's benefits to people. Their populations are declining, which means we're often starting to lose some of these benefits, but nothing is as troubling, I would argue, as wholesale extinctions, because those are essentially irreversible. So how can we prevent losing species um, and ensure that we safeguard them for future generations? We need to put them on the map and that means we need to deliver the best possible science and evidence that at least we're not unknowingly losing some of these species, that we support effective conservation decision making. And in essence, it means we need to identify the places that are needed to safeguard species. That's a huge effort and we are really fortunate and excited to be able to bring together a whole large group of talented junior scientists to support this effort with models, with informatics, with taxonomic expertise. And uh, we are convening the, the global scientific community, for example, under the umbrella of the Geo Biodiversity Observation Network to think about the essential information that is needed to uh, address species distributions and support conservation decision making and that allows us to at increasingly fine spatial detail predict model um, some of those species here for example a hummingbird in south america at a kilometer resolution and it's that sort of detail that begins us that begins uh, to enable us a, a smart conservation decision making on the ground here an effort led by charles marsh for mammals worldwide again at a kilometer resolution here bringing out the, the diversity hotspots and cold spots in, in really fascinating detail here for primates in East Africa. And it's with this sort of information that we can then begin to, to support the decisions regionally, the decisions that need to be taken by others, uh, local stakeholders, that at all levels we want to support with this information to, for example, ensure that species such as the, the Ugandan red colobus are uh, conserved for future uh, generations. So as scientists, uh, we can't dictate what sort of information, what sort of decisions might actually happen and how it, this information needs to be brought into the picture and brought together with other pieces. Um, but uh, we can at least provide that piece and it's a really uh, important piece. Here we are at the global scale beginning to, to uh, link that information up ourselves with at least some other pieces such as the existing a reserve network, what we know about encroachment already happening in the region. And it's that sort of a combination and the use of spatial optimization procedures that, that bring in complementarities of which these places would combine best to provide um, conservation for as many species as possible uh, uh, going forward. And it's, it's these sorts of approaches that give us priority maps, half earth maps, if you will, of where are the places that are most urgently needed to be brought under some sort of conservation management, whether that be a protected area or other approaches, so that species can be safeguarded uh, going forward. So in yellow here, places that are particularly important. 
And we don't need quite yet uh, half of the planet for this, at least not for terrestrial vertebrates, but as we think about additional groups, we need to think about more and more of these places. And we critically need to bring that together with other information. We need to offer this up to indigenous uh, communities, to um, uh, decision makers at all levels to use this information as they think about spatial planning in the regions. We need to recognize, though, that these places are very unevenly distributed across the globe and that the tropics in particular, the biomes there, have a particularly large burden. The, the people there ultimately have a particularly large burden to think about how they can not just safeguard but also manage and restore some of the places there so that species aren't going extinct globally. So this requires a pulling together of the global community to make this happen. It also needs a consideration of additional dimensions such as carbon and water to ensure that we are not just optimizing biodiversity conservation but also carbon uh, storage and, and water uh, security going forward for everybody. We can extend that thinking to the marine realm here, uh, work on marine fishes that follows a similar kind of uh, approach and that allows us to identify the most important places for safeguarding fish uh, species going forward. And in this case, not just thinking about that species group, but also uh, addressing uh, the, the cost of things, or the opportunity cost, so the fishing uh, cost, the, the loss to, to, to fishing economies in the region. And there are ways to ultimately optimize both so that you really minimize uh, the burden that's placed on regional fishing economies. Now, this year is a particularly important and exciting year to think about these issues as we are in the midst of the post-2020 biodiversity framework discussions. What is that? It's uh, one of the conventions under the, that came out of the Rio Earth Summit 1992. Many of you will be familiar with the uh, um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the IPCC process that was associated with that, that brought about the Paris Agreement, a really bold agreement that nations worldwide committed to, to limiting temperature increases going forward. Now, we are in a similar sort of process leading up to the 21 Kunming Agreement next year that we all hope might be a similar sort of Paris moment of a bold target for uh, biodiversity. And it's under the Convention on Biological Diversity that these negotiations are, are taking place. And it's um, uh, with, in the context of these action targets that uh, countries are currently discussing that we can think about what might be next and how we can contribute science to these efforts. There is a, a relatively ambitious target being discussed right now of 30% conservation of land and sea, uh, with areas particularly important for biodiversity by 2030. There is also an emphasis on quality information, so importance of science in contributing to this and the importance of the equitable participation by all, so all genders, all races, all uh, types of, of administration, all regions, indigenous communities, everybody should be empowered to contribute to these decisions. And that's why the not just the rigorous development, but also the sharing and democratizing of this information is so important. That fits beautifully with what we're trying to support with the half earth science. And one particular concrete contribution that we're developing is uh, an index, an indicator that's already been used in some of the assessment processes and is listed for uh, that effort going forward under the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's a very simple metric. It's how well are countries respectively doing in conserving the species that they hold responsibility for. So how close to what would be an, a minimum a target of conservation areas supporting a particular species are they meeting? So an SPI, a Species Protection Index of 100, would mean that all of a country's species are sufficiently represented in either formal or informal reserves or, or conservation areas. How well are we doing for terrestrial vertebrates right now? We were able to quantify that and it's not 100%. We are at about 41% on average uh, that we are achieving. So there's a lot yet to be done to ensure that all species of terrestrial vertebrates are sufficiently safeguarded going forward. And some countries here have a particularly large burden and responsibility. Countries such as Madagascar, Australia, Philippines hold a lot of the very restricted, unique biodiversity of the world and have a lot to do. And it can't be just their responsibility. We need to pull together as a global community, which fits very much 
the convention of biological diversity uh, discussions. And by the way, the United States here also in the top 25 as global uh, of countries worldwide in terms of the amount of unique biodiversity that they hold responsibility for, and still quite a bit to go. An SPI of currently estimated 55, so much more to be done in supporting conservation action. And how does this happen? Well, it happens at the regional level, at the state level, as in the US, as well as in many other countries. So that's where the rubber hits the road. And in the case of California, for example, quite a, a substantial global responsibility that's held by just this state, uh, over 1,700 plant species occurring uh, in just that region. So California holds the global responsibility for these species. And we're really fortunate last year at Half Earth Day to support some of the key conversations around this responsibility and the actions and activities that might be happening in support of a Half Earth type uh, um, role in California. And uh, we had the secretary of the California Natural Resource Agency there. We had the former governor speak to us about those opportunities, those needs. And uh, it, 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 it was immensely uh, special when then just earlier this month, Governor Newsom of California went ahead and committed the state to 30% of land and coastal waters to be conserved by 2030. And it's the first state that's supporting the goals, this ambitious target by the Convention of Biological Diversity that's currently still under discussion. So an amazing uh, role model here, if you will, played by the state of California. So with that, we say thank you, Governor Newsom. I thank you for, for listening and I hope I was able to excite you about the opportunities and the need to bring science at the global as well as down to the regional and ultimately one kilometer and final spatial resolution into um, some of these conversations. And uh, uh, beautifully linking to that is a panel discussion that we're holding in about 15 minutes today on Half Earth Day, where we'll be bringing together some of the key decision makers uh, and, and players in California, uh, including the Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity, uh, as well as uh, at the global scale, uh, representatives from the World Conservation Monitoring Center, as well as uh, joining a conversation uh, around these ambitious targets in California and how science can contribute to ensure that evidence uh, and policy are being brought together across scale. So please join us for these conversations. And now I'm handing over to Craig Miltz of Visuality to talk more about the specific exciting ways in which we can um, convey this information to all sorts of uh, levels of society. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I think you'll agree when you start to look at the science and the outputs that are possible from the Half Earth project, we are at a unique moment in time because now we have the information and we will have more information as we go that will allow us to embed species information at high resolution right at the center of society. And we start with the big decisions that are being taken at the intergovernmental levels right now through the end helping governments understand how to set their targets through the Species Protection Index. But that's just the beginning. Once targets are set, the world needs to then protect half of the planet. And when I start to think about that, I look at that as a 20-year problem. In 20 years' time, I hope, half of the planet will be protected. And when I look at that, I also start to think about the last 20 years. And, if, and these are pictures of every summer over the last 20 years. So think about it, it's like a 20 summer problem, right? And when I look at that, I think to myself, okay, so as well as dealing with what's happening today, we need to prepare those young professionals or those people late in their academic careers uh, or their education, we need to prepare them for when the moment comes where they have more influence, they are ready to join this movement and to protect half of the planet. Because whilst technology can be used for helping intergovernmental processes, 
It has to go way beyond that because half earth is a movement. And we can supply information and we can supply science to the technical, technically minded. But it also is being received by humans and humans are emotional creatures and humans will require information in a way which not only sorts out their logical mind but also sorts out their emotional one too. And I'll give you an example of this. Let's say I want to know something about Gorongosa National Park. So I want to know where Gorongosa National Park is. So what do I do? I go into Google, I type in Gorongosa National Park, I go to the map and I find out where it is. But what if I wanted to get a feel of Gorongosa National Park? What if I wanted to get just a sense and a feeling of what was there? Then you'd want to present information in very different ways. Actually, the underlying data, the underlying science and technology is very similar. What is different is how you apply like emotion to the design of that information. And for me, that's really important. And it's a principle we try and translate through the mapping work of, of Half Earth and all the technology that we're building around this. Because in these next 20 years, we are going to have to connect with people's hearts as well as their minds. So when you look at the Half Earth Project map online, and this is available online to go and explore, you'll get a sense of vibrancy. You'll get a sense of um, the ability to explore and play. You'll see that there is science and data that underpin all of these maps, but we try and present it in a way which kind of invokes a level of exploration. So you can go to Madagascar and you can see how well they're protecting their place. You can look at what the pressures are in that area. And you can start to understand and get an appreciation and a feel for those places. For me, that's really important. Now, if we take the example of target setting and countries trying to figure out how much of their land and sea that they need to protect, then emotion comes into that too. And what we've tried to do is through the power of this new science, allow people to explore every single country on the planet, look at the species protection ind indices of those places, and get a feel for those places while they're doing it. So you can go to Costa Rica, you understand that the species protection index is 52.9. And you can look at where in the country it's best to protect next, certainly for land vertebrate species. And you can look where they're protecting currently. You can start to delve into individual species. You can start to look at the composition of vertebrate species. And as we get more, map more and more species, you'll get more and more information, right? You can get you know, more nerdy if you want, and you can look at all the lists and you can go on further from there if you want to. And to try and make this as accessible as possible, if you don't have great internet speeds, then you can take this away as fact sheets and share it with people. Again, I see this as an incredibly important part of it. Now, this is cool. So you go to Costa Rica and you say, okay, so which other countries are a bit like mine? Of course, the first country you think about is Azerbaijan, right? So you go to Azerbaijan and you go, well, actually, this species protection index is similar to mine. And I'm going to see how they're doing. And I'm going to try and talk to them. And I'm going to see what species are there. And I'm going to get lost in, wouldn't it be great to get lost in, like, um, the exploration of the planet rather than Facebook feeds? That'd be good, right? And that's what we're trying to achieve, that sense of wonder. I just wanted to touch briefly on the, again this 20 year time horizon that we've got that there's some there's there's some forces at play here which are going to come into effect in the next probably five years one of those are uh hardware so soon we'll be able to put a set of glasses on we'll be able to immerse ourselves in nature and for me that's incredible like the big hardware organizations are already 
putting out technology which can do this. And we're trying to set up, you'll see with the three-dimensional work that we do with the Half Earth uh, experience, that we're preparing ourselves for the moment when technology moves and when augmented reality, virtual reality becomes a thing which is used by more and more people. And even if it's not, certainly connectivity to each other into places are going to get higher. And this is really critical now because those forces at play, those forces of improving technology, improving accuracy, resolution and uh, of science is all going to be underpinned by something which we don't have to do anything about, which is the biophilia, right? As E. Olson would say. We want to connect people. Humans want to be connected with nature. And we're providing a digital experience which allows them to do it. So while they, while humans leave nature and move to cities which is and urban areas, which is already happening, and nature recedes from them, which is already happening, we want to just invoke that biophilia in people by creating experiences which immerse them in nature. And if we can do that over the next 20 years, hopefully I'll be close to retirement by then, we will be able to protect half of the planet. Thank you. ask why should I care about the ocean? I'm not anywhere near it. It doesn't affect me. Science is showing us that most of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean. The funding crisis for ocean science is really, really dangerous. That is going to affect all of us. How long is that iceberg gone? Some people call me Deep Sea Dawn. I got interested in oceanography as a child, and then at the age of eight, I decided I want to be an ocean geologist. I've been on many, many ocean expeditions. I've been to parts of the world underwater that very few people have seen before. I have explored places and seen places for the first time, from Antarctica to the volcanoes under the Sea of Japan. It's been great. <laughs> I'm still, uh, still a child inside. What I love most about the ocean is the sense of uh, adventure and freedom. To me, the ocean is life. Growing up in Hawaii, you are part of the ocean. The ocean is sacred. We are so enamored with how much we know about the moon. We know all about the different craters of the moon. We know about Mars and Venus, but we don't have the same level of understanding of the Earth. And that's because we have not mapped the oceans at the same level of detail. I'm the chief scientist of ESRI, which also stands for the Environmental Systems Research Institute. ESRI needs a chief scientist because science underpins everything that the company produces. ESRI creates a whole series of base maps, and one of our really important base maps is an ocean base map. It shows you the world's underwater topography. To have a map, a detailed map of the entire ocean floor is so important because it helps us to understand the totality of this planet. The oceans are doing this amazing job of absorbing the excess greenhouse gases that human activity is putting into the atmosphere. But they're absorbing a lot of heat. The higher sea surface temperatures create larger storms, maybe more frequent storms. The oceans are really the engine of climate change, so we need to understand the oceans and to map the oceans for all of those reasons. 
by doing that, we've actually seen that. When funding for science is cut, the consequences are severe. If we don't have the funding for students, we could lose a whole generation of creative, innovative scientists to help us push forward. Helping to make these discoveries with us that make all of our lives better. With the recent cuts that we've experienced, I won't say that it's completely destroying ocean science, but certainly making it more difficult for us to move forward. Our great ships of science, such as the Sally Ride and the Roger Revelle, sit in port, and everyone loses. In science, we're all trying to make a contribution. We all stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. So I'm just one of the, the pieces in the puzzle. If we don't make science a priority in this country the way that we have in the past, the stakes are that we will lose us. We will not be the United States of America that we have been. We will not be leaders and innovators. We will not be a force for good in the world. Science is intrinsic to who we are, to what we have become the good things about this nation. We can't afford to go back. My name is Peter Naskreki. Uh, I am half Earth Chair and I also direct the uh, E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Laboratory in Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. I believe that a project as ambitious and as important as half Earth will succeed only if it is able to take full advantage of local taxonomic expertise, uh, local conservation exp expertise, and especially in those countries that combine exceptionally high biodiversity and relatively low or, or nearly non-existent biodiversity exploration and documentation infrastructure. Uh, one of such countries is Mozambique, where for the last seven years I've been leading the effort to comprehensively document the species richness and ecological complexity of Gorongosa National Park. Uh, as part of the process, we created uh, the Wilson Lab which uh, I might say is probably one of the most advanced uh, biodiversity uh, research laboratories on the continent. And throughout this process, I have had an opportunity to work with some of the brightest, most enthusiastic uh, students and young scientists that I've ever met. Um, but they need our help. And so soon I will announce the Half Earth Project Fellowship in Biodiversity Exploration and Taxonomy in Gorongosa National Park. This fellowship will achieve several goals. First and foremost, we want to increase the number of Mozambican taxonomic expert and, uh, experts and conservationists. We'll achieve that by inviting them to two to six month long visits to Gorongosa, where they will work side by side with invited uh, taxonomic experts to prepare them uh, to become independent researchers and explorers of Mozambican uh, biodiversity. We are hoping that this fellowship will also allow some of them, uh, some of the students and scientists, uh, to further their education and academic careers. And soon you will meet some of them, uh, including Ricardo Guta, who is uh, our uh, newest uh, half-earth scholar, who will soon be attending uh, Cape Town University, where he will study taxonomy of insects and conservation of invertebrates. And I also want to say that during this fellowship, uh, these Mozambican taxonomists will help uh, collect and build biodiversity da data sets that then will feed directly into the map of life, which is one of the principal tools of the Half Earth projects. And while we will start in Gorongosa, uh, these new taxonomists will continue their work throughout the country and eventually across the entire region. Uh, they will also act as mentors and role models 
to future generations of uh, biodiversity conservationists and taxonomy experts. As Half Earth Chair in Mozambique, my goal is to create a lasting, meaningful change in the way taxonomic and other biodiversity data are collected and made available. I hope that a few years from now, Mozambique will be the center of taxonomic expertise for at least several understudied groups of organisms, and that the data that this project generates will become a critical step towards the success of Half Earth. My name is Ricardo Guta. I am a Half Earth scholar and also an entomologist and research technician at A.O. Wilson Biodiversity Laboratory in Gorongosa National Park. I study insects, which are the most diverse organisms on the Earth, and because they are so tiny, there are still a lot of species that have not been yet described, and some of them face the extinction before being discovered. I am very fascinated by studying insects because they play a key role in natural and anthropogenic ecosystems, such as uh, participate in the nutrient cycle, pollinate plant, dispersal of seeds, and maintain soil extraction and fertility, and control population, and provide food for other organisms. My main group of study is orthoptera, such as grasshopper, katydate, and cricket. In this group, I am investigating their taxonomy, bioacoustics, and phylogenetics to understand the biogeographical distribution of their species and use this information for conservation purpose. I am now applying to master program in conservation biology at Cape Town University in South Africa. So hello and uh, welcome back to all of you participating in the Half Earth Day uh, session today. Um, we are in the science session and uh, after we just heard and saw some, some wonderful uh, stories told by video after those really inspiring clips. We are now on to the uh, uh, panel discussion and uh, I, I couldn't be more excited to have uh, a, 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 a most outstanding uh, caliber of, of uh, scientists, practitioners, um, and uh, uh, just all around uh, exemplar conservationists with us uh, today. My name is Walter Jetz. I'm the chief scientist of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, and I'll be moderating uh, this panel discussion. And I have uh, uh, with me today virtually from uh, uh, Leipzig, uh, Enrique Pereira, who is the co-chair of the GEO Biodiversity Observation Network and also professor of biodiversity conservation at IDIF Germany. Um, over from the United Kingdom uh, is joining us uh, Hilary Allison. She's uh, head of the Ecosystem Assessment and Policy Support Program of the United Nations uh, Environmental Program World Conservation uh, Monitoring Center. And uh, uh, we have three participants from uh, California. Uh, John Jarvis is the executive director of the Institute for Parks, People and Biodiversity at uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, as many of you know, he's also former director of the, the National Park Service. Uh, we have uh, Dawn Wright also on the panel. She's the ESRI chief scientist and uh, a board member of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Uh, and then we're really privileged to have uh, Jennifer Norris with us. She's the deputy secretary for biodiversity and habitat of the California Natural Resources uh, Agency. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today for our panel discussion on linking evidence and policy in species conservation. Countries are stewards of their biodiversity and their institutions, as we all know, are at the, the front line of the decisions that affect species on a daily basis. This year and next year, we have some really vital discussions going on internationally uh, under the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And many of us uh, hope that the final outcome of, of that discussion of 
that the framework development might be a, a Paris moment for biodiversity, a really ambitious goal um, to safeguard species for future generations. And uh, in this discussion, we'll start out uh, with the, the global scale, the big picture, the international frameworks, followed then by the regional scale and, and then a, a discussion which we're trying to, to bridge the scales. And uh, it's a real pleasure to, to start out now uh, with uh, the, the global science policy uh, framework discussion. And I want to head over to, to Hillary uh, Allison from UNEP WCMC to uh, start out with a, a brief statement. Thank you, Hillary, for joining us today. Thank you very much indeed, Walter, for that uh, excellent warm welcome. Um, I'm very privileged to be here. Um, so I just wanted to cover the sort of very general context in which all this is happening. And uh, since the global agreement on nature at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, which is the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, it's 196 signatory countries have created a series of global plans to address some of the relentless declines in biodiversity. But unfortunately, the latest stock take of uh, progress, which was published last month, Global Biodiversity Outlook, as it's known, it shows that none of the 20 biodiversity targets that we set in 2011 will be met in their entirety. And 2020 was meant to be the year to agree a new 10-year global master plan for biodiversity uh, at the upcoming UN Biodiversity Conference uh, known as COP15. Indeed, thousands of us actually should have been in China right now, either as experts watching those negotiations unfold or indeed as governments participating in the negotiations. All of us hoping, as you put it, for a Paris moment uh, for biodiversity when countries would set ambitious goals and they would be sufficient to finally reverse the loss of biodiversity on which we all depend. Um, of course, those negotiations have been postponed to 2021 by the global pandemic, hopefully not to 2022. Uh, but the new timetable um, for these negotiations is, is still uncertain, it's shifting, and there's some very real practical challenges facing the United Nations in negotiating any international agreement by remote means rather than face to face. But despite all of this, um, highly detailed preparatory work on the, on the post-2020 framework continues. And a working group has prepared uh, a zero draft. And conservation scientists from around the globe have been contributing to many, many consultation meetings on the content of the framework in the last 18 months. And there's been a real surge of relevant scientific papers on everything on, from overarching concepts and opinion pieces through to really detailed proposals on um, goals and targets. So the zero draft um, includes four overarching goals and 20 action oriented targets. Um, the first goal, which is of most interest to this audience, I guess, uh, focuses on ecosystems, species and genetic diversity. Um, and the goal text as it stands includes direct reference to reducing the number of threatened species and increasing abundance of species. So of course, species conservation underpins um, at least two of the other goals on sustainable use of nature to benefit people and the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits of ge genetic resources. So tracking the number of threatened species and the abundance of species through the accompanying monitoring framework will rely directly on monitoring and modeling of species trends and the selection of rigorous indicators, which is where science can come in. And uh, with what, just one working group meeting remaining to prepare a final draft of the framework for COP15, we're at a critical point in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework process. Um, scientific input and advice remain key uh, because numeric values for the goals and targets have yet to be pinned down. However, um, the window of opportunity for scientific inputs to the framework will gradually close the closer we get to COP15 uh, because that's when policymakers negotiate in fine detail the wording and nuances of the plan, which is sometimes an unpredictable process colored by political positions and different worldviews. Of course, once the framework is actually agreed, uh, species conservation scientists uh, take up a new role of helping to track progress through a focus on data provision, indicators, and of course, analyses of the effectiveness of, of delivery. 
So I think that's uh, probably a good point for me to stop and I'll hand back to Walter. Thank you very much, Hilary. Uh, very much appreciated. And you're obviously uh, um, uh, involved in many of these discussions uh, and uh, a real expert following this arena. Thank you for all your, your efforts there and for sharing uh, your, your perspective today with us. Uh, handing over to Enrique now, Enrique Pereira, professor at IDIF and the co-chair of the Geobiodiversity Observation Network with uh, his perspectives that are more from the academic and, and the scientific arena. Thank you, Walter. And uh, thank you also to Hilary to making a bit my work easier by providing a bit of the context. And as Hilary uh, nicely explained, 2020 is really a key year for biodiversity. In 2010, countries established the so-called 2020 IG goals, these 20 targets for 2020. And uh, um, both the IPBES uh, uh, report and more recently the Global Biodiversity Outlook uh, report have shown that we didn't meet most of those targets. The challenge now is how do we move forward? And how do we move forward has two components. One is setting up those targets uh, in an effective way but also monitoring the progress towards those tra targets, as Hillary mentioned. And I would say that much of the challenge, personally for me, the biggest challenge is in adequate monitoring of the targets. And you cannot really do policy or management without good monitoring of what is happening on the ground. And this has been proving the most challenging aspect. In reality, the CBD has had targets since the beginning of the century, around 2000 to the first type of targets was established. There was a 2010 target. There was a 2020 target. We're now establishing post-2020 targets. There'll be targets for 2030 and maybe even some more uh, milestones towards 2050. But the monitoring of those targets has been, I'll say, the Achilles heel in many cases where we have still not a comprehensive understanding of what's happening to biodiversity change. And so we have a very complex picture now of biodiversity change. And the big challenge, and this has been the challenge that the Jubon community has been, uh, has been addressing is how do we get better data uh, on this. And just to give you an example of how this is important in the relationship with the with the of Earth, one of the targets that is being discussed now is in terms of protected areas. So a number is being thrown. So it's first to throw a number, you already have to have some data because you cannot throw numbers of targets without knowing where you are. So a number is now being thrown and for you know area of uh, today, there is, we know it's around 30% that is the target right now. Um, now, 30% of today, there is may mean a lot of things. It may mean that you have protection everywhere, but you or it may mean that you have um, uh, strict protection only in five or th five or two percent of that 30%. That's very different. And data is an um, um, missing and understanding how effective these different types of protected areas are. And apparently, for instance, not apparently, uh, we have shown, for instance, that in many regions in the world, deforestation is greater inside protected areas than outside protected areas. What means that in many regions of the world, protected areas are not being effective. Um, what are the, the types of things that that you are most excited about right now uh, that perhaps you see coming through uh, Hillary at, at the very high level, like those are the sorts of new things that are coming in terms of indicators or, or ways to, to track progress or, or along some of these targets. Uh, and Enrique, what are you seeing from, from the science side? Perhaps uh, over to you first, Hillary. Thanks, Walter. 
I mean, I think um, one of the, the great white hopes for many years has in fact been the development of really good remote sensing data. Um, and the Sustainable Development Goals uh, framework, it has been committed very seriously to uh, identifying ways that remote sensing earth observation data can actually support, you know, rapid, perhaps not, you know, even particularly uh, fine grained monitoring, but at least giving a, a kind of rapid, almost real time sense of the pace of change. Um, and that's a really, um, that, I think that's a, a, an area that we need to all work on and invest in considerably. But, uh, you know, initiatives like, you know, Global Fisheries Watch, Global Forest Watch are, you know, are great. And we need to kind of do more in that respect. It's really exciting to have uh, some of the, the, the experts uh, of that arena uh, who have been, been active for a long time uh, and are very, very active right now in the, the second segment of our discussion. Uh, uh, where we're going to talk about, yes, the United States, uh, uh, the Park Service, uh, the reserves in this country, uh, but then also uh, California as a, as a particular example. I'm handing over now to, to John Jarvis, who is at, at UC Berkeley and is the former head of the uh, uh, US National Park Service. John. Uh, thank you, Walter, and uh, thank you, Hillary and Enrique, for uh, sort of setting me up uh, to talk about this. Um, having served <clears throat> with the National Park Service, <clears throat> excuse me, for 40 years um, and as the director, uh, I know very well that parks and equivalent reserves, both uh, here in the United States and around the world, have an essential role in biodiversity conservation. And they, in my mind, they serve one as containing biodiversity hotspots, <clears throat> and two is that they can be refugia for species that are under stress from climate change. Uh, but unfortunately, we also know that about <clears throat> only one third of the um, protected areas around the world are effectively managed. Um, and by effectively managed, I mean, one is that the managers of that protected area have made biodiversity conservation a priority in terms of their uh, many, many priorities that they have. <clears throat> Second, that they have a strategy for climate adaptation uh, built in uh, to their planning. And third is that they have a monitoring system, as Enrique pointed out, uh, to really understand what they are managing and what its condition is. Uh, in the U US National Park System, we instituted that kind of monitoring system about 20 years ago and are really collecting a, a great body of data uh, about biodiversity uh, within the US system. We also know that these parks are not large enough, um, that they are in many ways the core of a much larger ecosystem, a much larger landscape as well. And science can provide the data for managers to make the decisions about how to create that connectivity across a larger landscape and what resources within the park need priority uh, and management action. And there are some really good examples in the US, for instance, like at Joshua Tree National Park here in California, where one of the species that is very vulnerable to climate change is the Joshua Tree itself. Um, and with really good science from the University of California, we were able to determine that there are places where Joshua trees can be resilient in spite of the climate uh, changes that we are seeing. So putting that, those refugia as a priority for actions to, to prevent uh, wildfire uh, or invasive species or other impacts builds in resilience into those park systems and we can monitor that and report on it to, to the American public as well. So <clears throat> what we're doing in California is really working at the ecosystem scale at a, at a, with uh, a California biodiversity network uh, that is really driven out of the University of California uh, with leadership at Berkeley uh, to bring that science uh, to the field, uh, to the practitioners, uh, to the state government, to the federal government, to private landowners, uh, to working landscapes to look at the ecosystem scale and figure out exactly what lands need to be protected in order to contribute to a much larger uh, effort around biodiversity conservation as well. So um, <clears throat> I actually think that the concept behind Half Earth, where we talked a lot about it at the last year uh, when we hosted the Half Earth Conference at Berkeley and uh, these new initiatives uh, coming out of CBD for the 30 by 30, are achievable in California uh, with the right commitment, the right kind of collaboration uh, and the right kind of science behind it. 
Thank you, John. Um, and uh, that obviously connects perfectly over to uh, uh, Jennifer Norris, uh, who is uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat in, in, in California, uh, working for the Natural Resources Agency. And uh, uh, she, she, I, I heard she may have some uh, really exciting news to talk more about today. Thank you, Walter, and, and thank you everyone for this panel. This is really great to be part of this. Yes, uh, California, we're very excited to say, is the first state to ever commit to the 30 by 30 conservation of lands and coastal waters um, target that has been set. Uh, that just happened yesterday. And we, um, we're committing to that target, but we're committing to achieving it in a very collaborative way. So building on what, what John described, as part of our 30 by 30 strategy, we, are, we also are establishing the California Biodiversity Collaborative, which is a, um, a platform to bring together scientists and government entities to work together around issues of biodiversity. And we have four main goals, which um, will govern our approach which is that we want to understand our biodiversity and the threats they face. That's where science absolutely comes in. Protect our species and ecosystems, obviously. Restore imperiled system, species and ecosystems. And I think most fundamentally, engage and empower all Californians to sustain our natural places and common home. We really want this collaborative to bring in other groups that haven't necessarily been engaged in the biodiversity space and ensure that as we're protecting 30% of our land, we're also considering equitable access uh, for all Californians. Um, so that biodiversity collaborative, it brings together the network that John described. And it also brings together a group of um, a, a biodiversity council, which is state and federal and local governments that work together on what their priorities are. And the idea is really to make sure that science is informing our policy decisions and also that policy needs are driving on science. Um, I've been in academia and I've been in government and it's clear to me that a lot of times those folks are talking in different rooms. Um, and so the Biodiversity Collaborative is really interested in bringing those people into the same room. And um, sometimes there's amazing science happening in academia that, that government scientists don't know how to access or they, don't, they can't use, or it isn't in the right format for them to sort of consider for their decision-making. So we're really interested in bringing that together into one space and also sort of getting down into those even more sub-regional conversations and making sure that we're taking the best of what California has to offer and bringing it into state government to help drive our priorities and how we strategically invest our resources. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm excited to be part of this group and this conversation because you all are really important to the work that we do. So thank you. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Chen. And that's really wonderful. Congratulations uh, to your team and, and the governor's office thank you. Uh, for uh, uh, really uh, yeah, being a, a role model here in, in, in so many ways uh, with the ambition and with the uh, 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 approach to bringing science and, and policy together. That's why it's so great to have you on today. And uh, this leads also uh, really excellently over to uh, Don Wright, who is the uh, chief scientist uh, of, at ESRI. Uh, um, because as we just heard, the sharing of information, uh, the spatial analysis is obviously at the heart of, of some of this decision and decision support. Um, and uh, so that fits very well with, with Dawn's uh, background, uh, but there is more, right Dawn, over to you. <laughs> yes, there's more. Thank you very much, Walter. And I'm extremely excited to be part of this conversation, uh, very honored. And I'm speaking to you from uh, near Joshua Tree National Park. So uh, I appreciate uh, the, the mention there uh, by John of that very important ecosystem. Uh, I would like to just take a couple of minutes to talk uh, at the local scale uh, about an effort that we hope will be uh, a very important contributor to Half Earth, certainly to the California 30% and uh, the California Biodiversity Collaborative that we've heard about uh, from Jen, all the way up to contributing to uh, the global goals, uh, the essential biodiversity uh, variable effort and so forth. And this is the Jack and Laura Dangerman Preserve. 
this is a very special place uh, in California that was made possible by the vision and generosity of, of my bosses, uh, Jack and Laura Dangerman, the co-founders of Esri, who in uh, December 2017 donated $165 million to the Nature Conservancy. It's the single largest gift in the history of that organization. In order for them to purchase this globally significant natural area and to protect it for future generations. This area, it's, uh, it's at Point Conception. So if you know the California coast, this is that great place where the coast takes that right angle turn. Uh, many people talk about it as the last perfect place in California. The, the preserve, the Dangerman Preserve covers about 24,000 acres or 38 square miles. It's about the size of San Francisco. Uh, it provides now land sea protection uh, because it's also adjoining to the Point Conception State Marine Reserve. So there are eight miles of coastline that are part of this preserve. Also the 20 square mile Halama watershed is part of this. And don't have time to, to show maps and so forth, but you can go to nature.org slash dangerman preserve to see maps and visuals. This is really uh, exciting, really important because this place is a linchpin, we hope, uh, of regional uh, protection and also ecological connectivity because it provides that uh, across natural areas of the national forest lands to the east and to the south of this area to the Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, coastal area to the north. And Point Conception is, an, is it's really at an ecological crossroads where northern and southern marine and terrestrial ecosystems converge. Hence, we've got a rich stew of biodiversity right here. Uh, many, uh, there, there may be as many as 700 species, about 10% of them are threatened, endangered or declining. We have predators, prey, rich fauna and flora uh, that are quite unique, many of which are found nowhere else on the planet. Uh, many species here are at the edge of their ranges. For instance, the tan bark oak ranges from the Oregon border all the way down to Point Conception. The California Corbina fish ranges from Baja all the way up to Point Conception. And again, there are only a handful of places in the world uh, like this quite a biodiversity uh, hotspot. And, and then from the, the standpoint of, of data, especially as Enrique uh, talked about the importance of monitoring on the ground and combining different types of data across spatial and temporal scales, this place is now becoming wired. We're calling it wild and wired. Uh, it's being surveyed with drone surveys, uh, light detection and ranging from aircraft, conservation apps and sensors, at the local scale, all the way up to satellite imagery at the broader scale. So this is helping us to, to realize the concept of a digital twin, a virtual representation of this place uh, that bridges the gap between the physical and digital worlds. And certainly speaking to uh, what Hillary uh, asked of the scientific community in terms of a place to, to access uh, this data uh, for, for policy. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. It's so exciting uh, uh, to see that reserve go in. Also something that just happened over the last couple of years uh, and, and so special. Uh, and I'm really uh, just thrilled by, by how we are actually connecting the scales here in this conversation, in this, in this panel, this short time we have, right? Going from global all the way down to a very particular place. Uh, and uh, that, that leads me a little bit to my, to my, to my question then also, right? How uh, you, Dawn, you, you, you emphasized how, uh, in, in this case, in this particular preserve, uh, the important biodiversity, the threatened biodiversity coincides with that location. And thanks to a lot of research in California, we, we knew that and it was, was well placed in that regard. Uh, a question to you uh, for first regionally, but then uh, also globally, I want to open this up, uh, this discussion. How could we uh, ensure that these these links between the evidence base and the information uh, and then the action, uh, the decisions uh, and uh, the proactive actions by donors or NGOs uh, or uh, governments uh, happen in a way that that really ensures um, safeguarding species for future generations, safeguarding biodiversity. Well, that's the challenge, right? I, I mean, I think 
one of the one of the blessings and one of the challenges really is that so many different people are gathering data at different scales and with different platforms and storing them in different places. And I know that um, it, it's not, I don't even think it's possible, but maybe Don will correct me, you know, to try to bring that all into one common data set. There are a lot of people who want to try, but having worked with data, that makes my head hurt. Um, but that said, I think that there, you know, to me, a, a first important step is really getting people aware of what is out there. We, we waste a lot of time reinventing the wheel. That's a fantastic point to bring up. One of the things that's happening at the Dangerman Preserve is that there are early career researchers from UC Santa Barbara, UCLA, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, uh, as well as USGS, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Smithsonian, uh, Point Blue Conservation Science, and they are all uh, scientists trying to meet those scientific goalposts, but they are so excited about use-inspired science and the idea that this science can be communicated beyond just the scientific journals to uh, citizens for more engagement and collaboration uh, to uh, the, the state, uh, to the world. And part of what they are excited about building is a digital collaborative. And uh, I agree with Jen, there's no one uh, data set to rule them all. I think uh, a better analogy is that you've got a system of Lego blocks uh, that build upon each other, that interconnect. And with the persistent imaging that we have at the preserve with the drones and the satellites and the sensors, we are also uh, building a platform to help people tell stories about uh, those data using story maps and to create apps so that policymakers, uh, govern, other government officials, uh, educators, uh, the, the whole cadre of the audiences that we're trying to reach, conservationists, resource managers, as well as scientists can make sense of these data and, and then can run with it. So thanks, Dawn. And, and of course, not everywhere in the world do we have the, the resources and the capacity, right, to, to put to this effort. Uh, as we, we do in California, but but uh, I, I'm really excited about the the general lessons that that we might learn here, right? The, about uh, remote sensing. Many of the remote sensing products are global and high resolution. Uh, some of these technologies are becoming cheaper and cheaper. It's possible to engage citizen scientists uh, everywhere, uh, and uh, uh, democratizing some of this information and putting it into the hands of people everywhere will probably be one of the the keys of of engaging them in in some of these. Uh, decisions. Um, so California clearly, uh, with the right decisions, there will be the sort of species benefit uh, that will arise in terms of preventing species extinctions uh, going forward. Uh, but that 30% uh, number may not be the right number everywhere. Uh, it may not be uh, as high a number to sustain, to safeguard all species in the United Kingdom, uh, uh, because many of those species occur in many other places. Um, so if you think about preventing global extinctions and the reserve network in, in that regard, what, what are your thoughts, perhaps uh, starting with, with, with Enrique and then over to, to, to Hillary on, on how this 30% uh, could play out globally if it becomes indeed uh, the target and what could be the tweaks or modifications to the wording or to the implementation that uh, we may need to be mindful about uh, to really ensure this framework is doing the best possible to, to safeguard species. So indeed, uh, Walter, 30% may not may be too little or too much and um, depending on the area. And it also depends on what those 30% mean. 30% uh, may mean very differently in California, then it will mean, let's say, in France or in Germany. Uh, in uh, Europe, the new biodiversity strategy that we had uh, approved this summer for Europe also has the 30%, but in addition, and this is one of the major changes here in Europe, is that now there is also a target for strict protection. So it's 30%. But of those 30%, one third should be strict protection. And this is really important because in reality in Europe, 
it's, it's estimated that less than 3% of the area is strictly protected. And so while it's very easy for Europe to go from 25 to 30, we, right now we are 25% protected area. Uh, it's not really very meaningful in my opinion, but going from two or between two and 3% and 10% of street protected area, this is extraordinarily difficult starting with Germany or France. It, it's, it's, it's so challenging because it's just, increasing by a factor of five or even a factor of 10 in some countries, the area that has to be strictly protective. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I do think we need qualifiers for what means to be protected. And it's, uh, it's very different to have, let's say sustainable use mm -hmm. to having areas where the biodiversity protection is the, is the main goal. But it's also important to place this protection in the right places, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. And so it's very heterogeneous across countries and yeah. within countries and within regions, very, very heterogeneous. Uh, there is not a single measure that fits all, mm -hmm. but this 10% uh, strict, 30% protective can be very inspirational and um, help move this uh, conservation forward. Hil Hilary. How do you think the policy arena could ensure that these aerial targets translate into actual species safeguarded? Well, the, 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 we've been touching on a really interesting kind of dilemma in this whole negotiation process that these sort of large, you know, global goals, you know, 30% or whatever the number may be, um, are, as Enrique said, sort of highly dependent on, you know, national circumstances. And this is a favorite phrase of the negotiators saying, you know, according to national circumstances or whatever. But, you know, what we mustn't forget is that um, the, the Convention on Biological Diversity places a, a duty on every country to prepare a national biodiversity strategy and action plan. And when the new framework comes in, those will obviously go through a cycle of eventually being re reformatted and rephrased so that the national contribution to that global goal can be described fully. And the real trick is whether that national, that's the sum of all those national commitments and national actions actually add up to the global target, um, be that for species conservation or for ecosystems or whatever it might be. Um, and that's the real trick. And so there is a, a real, there is a potential danger that we end up with um, an implementation gap um, and a commitments gap. You know, people will say we can commit to do this, we can commit to do that, whether it, you know, what, whatever it may be about. But if it doesn't add up to the, the, the global ambition, then we're in, a, we're in a real, you know, we've got a real challenge here. So I think that's one of the, the key things that, um, that the sort of the species community, species conservation community and the, and the general science community will have to kind of really keep a, a weather eye out for when it comes to the negotiations around the new post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So that's a, that's a really interesting and, uh, and difficult conundrum, I think. Thank you, Hilary. And I think that maybe may yet another opportunity for leadership, actually looking at Chen here and in, in thinking again of California as a model, right? How can, will California make sure that all the species are accounted for, that species extinctions perhaps are going to be not greater than background uh, rate of extinctions usually would be. Um, and uh, with that, we're coming to the end of our, our discussion today. Actually, I just want to hand over to to John and, and Chen and, and Don uh, for, for final time with comments on that particular question or any, any closing comments from, from there and perhaps starting with John, thanks. Well, thanks Walter and thanks uh, for everybody for your incredible contributions to this discussion. I think um, what's, we need to remember that when, you know, the nations, when they gather for the CBD and they talk about national circumstances, they're really talking about political and public support for the effort. And so I think we all have incumbent on us uh, an effort around educating the public around the value of biodiversity conservation. Um, that there tends to be a, a lot of blank stares out there when you talk about it, unfortunately. Um, and that to recognize that this work is, it's not a loss uh, to conserve biodiversity through protection or, or making strict protection. Uh, it's an investment. Uh, it's an investment in the future. 
uh, for all uh, values, health, you know, welfare, lifestyle, economy, um, you know, a whole number, access, recreation, and biodiversity. And so we, we need to be better at, at communicating uh, this work uh, in a way that captures uh, the excitement of, of the public, but regardless of, of country, um, in order to uh, achieve uh, these goals. And I think in California, sometimes it's a little easier because we have a fairly environmentally aware uh, populace, um, but uh, there's still some challenges. And so I think that's an area that we also need to focus on as we move forward. Thank you, John. Dawn, any, any uh, final comments from your end on this topic? Well, I, I think uh, also there is the idea of um, the importance of biodiversity uh, in terms of pandemics. I mean, that's another linkage that we haven't had the opportunity to talk about. But as we destroy the biodiversity of this planet, we are also making ourselves more uh, vulnerable to uh, these diseases that jump from the animal species to us. But that's, that's another, again, another panel. Uh, I think, uh, and it's been wonderful to be part of this conversation and the idea of assessing these species so that they are no longer uh, in danger. Uh, I think another important effort is to assess their importance or their, how much they're being stressed not only what species are where and when, but which are uh, the most in danger. So uh, as we tie that uh, activity into our efforts as well, such as a, an existing map of biodiversity importance now exists for the United States, uh, that, will, that will be very helpful to our efforts as well. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, and I'll, I'll give the, the final word uh, from the panelists here to, to Chen. Thank you. Well, thanks. I, I want to echo uh, sort of what John said, which is what Governor Newsom said when he signed the executive order as, um, establishing the goal and establishing the collaborative, that we should approach biodiversity conservation from, an, from a mindset of abundance, not consider it a zero-sum game, but see it as, as part of, uh, of what makes being human uh, possible. And I thought that was really important, that, that thought that it's abundant. It's a win-win for everyone. Um, and I also want to say, as an ecologist, you know, I think probably you all share this with me. You know, I see the world is all interconnected. What what piece links to what other piece? And being part of this panel just makes me feel interconnected with all of you in this global effort. And that's just really inspiring. And I'm so delighted to be part of this group. And I'll be reaching out to you for support and um, guidance moving forward because California really wants to make a difference. And I'm, I'm grateful for everyone's contribution to the taking care of our planet. So thank you. Thank you, Walter, for setting this up. It's really been wonderful. Well, thank you all for, for participating. And those were thank some you. excellent cl closing remarks, uh, Jen. Um, it's, it was really special. We really bridged here the scales from a local single reserve uh, and the outstanding opportunities arising from there all the way to the globe and those important framework discussions that are going on right now. So obviously, we uh, only touched on some of the many, 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 many facets that are important in this arena of linking evidence and policy and species con conservation. But uh, uh, it uh, uh, was a really special moment for me, for sure, to, to have this discussion with you and, and try and bring this all together in, in 45 minutes or so. Thank you so much for your time and your participation um, and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you.